Okay, uh, selamat pagi, salam sejahtera, and salam kampus Rama. A very good morning to you all, to our esteemed colleagues, doctors, associate professor, professors who are present here today. Today we are here to brief you about the uh, systems available at the Center for e-learning for the teaching and learning as well as for OER. Now today we have an uh, we had this problem with the network and our OER system is currently offline so you can uh, you can log in but the content is not visible so I will cover that later but today we will focus on the learning management system. So for each roadshow we focus on specific aspects of the training. So I will cover that briefly in the slides so you get an overview of what we are going to cover today. So today, the first thing which we are going to learn about is the UMS learning management system, which you are all familiar with, but there is some functionality which I need to uh, inform you about in the system, such as the some of the our colleagues are not uh, aware of the backup and restore function as well as some of the formats which are available in the system. So I will cover those in the learning management system. The second one is the criteria for audit. Now in UMS we are, as you are all familiar with, you may be aware that we are following that 1732 formula, but most of our colleagues at the other IPTAs have uh, migrated to what is known as the 40, 40, 20, system. This is under the Majlis E Pambalajaran IPTA Negara. So this is the uh, overall body which governs e-learning. So they have proposed what is known as the 40-40-20 criteria. Currently, you uh, may not be aware of it, but our Senate has not approved of this as yet. So we will not be implementing it for this audit cycle. We, only once the Senate approves, we will migrate to the 40-40-20. This is similar to our current audit criteria. The only difference is there is an element of interaction which is captured. That is the 40 is the content, 40 is the interaction, which is the chat and so on and so forth. And 20 is the, uh, the what is known as the assessment. So we will focus on that uh, when it comes. But I want you to give you a heads up as to how the system will change with regard to audit. The other one is the open educational resources uh, repository. So, as I mentioned today, the system is uh, not accessible. I will show you how to log in and register so that those of you who do not have an account can register the system, deposit your material there and use that material for uh, lecture content and so on and so forth. And the last element which I'm going to focus on today is the massive open online courses. So these are courses which can be developed in the system. I will show you the procedure for developing the courses and the workflow for the course material. So uh, on behalf of the Center for e-learning, we would like to congratulate your new e-learning coordinator, Dr. Nazia, who has been recently appointed and I wish her all the best. Okay, so she will be uh, looking after your uh, e-learning needs and she'll be reporting to us and we will address those challenges as you encounter them. So the f we will go through some of the basic procedures in the course. So I have created for each roadshow, we create a course template. This is an IPMB course template. So I will give you the link in the chat box and you can register in that course. So the, after the training is over, you can use that template for your reference and future reference. So the first thing which we do is teach you how to restore an old course. Then we teach you how to register your students. So we have multiple options for registering. I think in IPMB, the number of students is not very large. So you can register them uh, by self-enrollment, but there are other options if your courses are having a large number of students and you have to manage them. So we give you a different option for registering, which is using a password and a user ID. Okay, then we will show you how to assign students to groups because some of us may be having group assignments. The course synopsis, course content and assignments are regular, but I will show you some other functions which are in the system, which have been newly installed. These are the creation of the groups by choice, as well as the analytics and other features. Okay, we will also focus on quiz, grading and uh, content from OER. This is the link based, uh, so that you can link your lecture directly into the system without going through the process of uploading and downloading and that procedure. So this actually saves you a lot of time if you use OER. Then I will show you how to communicate using Moodle Mobile Plus and also to put in some grading criteria. So this is one of the challenge which we encounter as lecturers. During the vetting session, we have to go back to an Excel worksheet and key in all the data, but you don't have to do that 
with smart uh, learning management systems or what is known as the Moodle LMS because there is a grading system. So you can actually do the entire process of grading within the system. All the formative assessment can be done here. I will show you how to create that grade book and then download that book as Excel work file, Excel worksheet. And then all you need to do is to add your additional uh, course content, uh, like, sorry, the course, um, uh, the final exams. That one has to be added. That's it. And then you can merge all the files and create a grade book. So that saves you a lot of time when it comes down to doing the grading and the uh, final vetting. And then we have, of course, the student learning behavior. For instance, if you uh, use the analytics feature in LMS, you can actually identify students who are lagging behind and those who are not uh, keeping up with the rest. So you can identify these using the analytics systems. Now, another element of the uh, e-learning portfolio is the massive open online courses. These courses are supposed to cater to the needs of not only our students, but external students as well, alumni, et cetera, and lifelong learners. So this MOC system we have established in the Smart V3. And uh, you can develop your own MOC. Now, based on the instructions received from the uh, top management at UMS, and based on our KRA, we require each uh, institute and uh, PUSAT as well as the uh, faculty to develop at least three MOCs. Okay, so there's a procedure for developing the MOC. I will briefly go through that procedure here and then I will cover it in detail. Our e learning uh, coordinator for the MOCs uh, and the OER is Puan Eugenia. So she manages the OER and the MOC systems. Okay, I will just cover it very briefly so that you know. So some of the faculties have actually developed MOOCs. This is the Faculty of Food Science and Nutrition and the PPST. So these MOOCs have been developed. I will briefly cover these MOOCs and what you need to do in order to develop the MOOC. Okay, so I need to, because the MOOCs is not quite clear. Some of the faculty members, they will ask, is this um, uh, like part of a course? Is it a micro-credential? So we need to clarify this. So I will clarify what exactly that MOOC is and how it is developed. Then we have the OER repository. Now this OER repository is has two functions. One is to allow you to create the content and store it for your entire career. As long as you're in UMS or even after you leave UMS, your content will still be stored in the OER repository. It's accessible globally. So that is part of the uh, commitment of UMS to outreach, global outreach. So this also helps us to improve our rankings and visibility. The other element of OER repository is that it allows you to uh, access content at any given time without uploading and downloading content such as lecture material and videos, etc. So this is one very good source which you can access at any given time and it's searchable using any of the search engines. Okay, there are some things which we'll discuss. I will uh, briefly, uh, those of you who may have to leave, uh, due to other commitments such as lecture, I will briefly introduce you to the MOOC and the procedure. Now, in UMS, we have developed a specific procedure for the MOCs. This is to uh, achieve the quality standards which are required by KPT because we can't create anything and put it as a MOC. So, what we have created is a course template in collaboration with the uh, Commonwealth of Learning. We have a course template which is very specific, and this course template is distributed as an open document. So we'll give it to you, we'll give you the link. You can download it and complete it. Now, what is the course template? A course template is something like a table 4.2, but it's not so detailed. It just covers the basics elements of the MOC. Now, once you have the course template ready, we uh, send it out to two reviewers, which you appoint. We won't be appointing the reviewers because there may be conflicts of interest. So we request you to uh, the names of two re reviewers. The review is conducted within two to four weeks. And then uh, the reviewers, as in a conventional peer review process, they will request improvements. You improve it and then we launch the course. Now, how much time is required for this MOC as far as you are concerned? Because every one of you is busy with your lectures and your other activities. So we have created a system whereby the MOOC is automated. Automated in the sense that once you uh, upload the content, 
the system will automatically detect the progress of the student and the student can access content based on their learning progress and learning outcomes. So that is about the MOOC. I will cover that in detail later for those of you who are interested in the MOC. Now for the MOC, because we cannot cover this on the roadshow completely and in its entirety, we have a specific training uh, session for those who are interested in MOC development. Okay, so that's what we'll be covering today. So let's begin like by going into the first element, which is the roadshow uh, platform. Okay, so for each roadshow, we create a platform for future reference. So I'm going to share this link with you in the chat window. So I copy it and I'll share it in the chat window here. Okay, there's a link which will uh, pop up in the chat window. Please click on the link and register for the roadshow course. Okay, this is a course. So after the session is complete, I will hand it over to you so you can look at it and view it and observe it and see what you want to learn from that system. Okay, so we create this uh, for each faculty because each faculty may have different kinds of requirements with regard to the system. For example, the faculty which has a large number of students may require a different set of guidelines and those who have few students may require different postgraduate is different as well. So this is based on the LMS itself. Okay, now when we start the course at the commencement of the academic year, the first thing we do, of course, is to enroll users. But there is something which you need to do before that, which is the backup and restore. I will briefly go through that. Okay, so this is the course here. You can see who's registering. Okay, so we can see that Dr. Teru, Associate Professor Dr. Teru, Associate Professor Dr. Jonita has registered and Dr. Balu, okay, Dr. Maran is here and Azia. So please register for this because you will have access to it. If you don't register and later on, you will have to ask the PEP Center to register you at the uh, at this particular platform. Okay, so what do we do at the beginning of the semester? We do something which is very important, which is backup and restore. For example, if you are teaching, usually we teach with a gap of one semester because we'll teach in semester session one, and then maybe in session two, you teach some other course. And then when you restore back to session one for the next year, you will be teaching the same course. So what you need to do with all your courses is to create what is known as a backup and restore. This saves you a lot of time because you don't have to upload content all over again. Let us go through that procedure, which is something which you should know at the first instance. So I'm going to go home and I'm going to pick any course which I have here, which is a course. For example, I go to my courses. I'm going to just use a course as a template. Okay. So let me pick up a course at the, let me pick up a MOOC course to use it as a template. Okay, now this is a uh, template which I use for training. Okay, so this has some elements inside. So this is a MOOC course. So let me see how we actually go through the process of backing up the content and then restoring it into a new course. Okay, so this is a previous year's uh, or previous semester's course, for example. And then you have reached the week 14, you have completed all your exams, and then you want to back up your course so that you don't have to keep on uploading all the content again. You can do it with a few clicks. So usually you will go down to your administration block. Now this administration block is uh, sometimes uh, pe people say we cannot see the block. Okay. The reason why you cannot see the block is because you have hidden it by default. So you sometimes when you open it into in a on your phone or your tablet, you may not see it. So all you need to do is go to course administration and you expand the block. So in this uh, block, you will see multiple features. So these are the controls for this particular block. Okay, you will see it. I'm, I'm actually viewing this from an administrator's console. So I can see different things, but you will basically see the uh, block as it is. Okay, the first thing which you need to do when you commence the semester is to restore your old course. But in order to do that, you need to back up your old course. So there's a button here called Backup, Restore and Import. There are three buttons. You click on the Backup button here. Backup. Okay. Now, when you go into the backup button, you will see the backup settings. Okay. It will show. It will ask you many complicated things. 
Okay, so you don't have to uh, select all because the machine will select uh, all these uh, parameters. Okay, there are some things which you can, can remove, which is the include enroll users. So, for example, your course, the old course has a certain number of users, but you don't want to transfer all these users into the new course, what is known as the process of migration. You don't want to migrate. So, what do you do if you don't want to migrate, you click here. So when you click on this link, which is a migration link, basically all the data related to those users will be lost. Okay, but suppose you want to have your course file for your MQA, your documentation. In that case, you click on this include enroll users. When you click on this, you will obtain a file, which is the entire content for your MQA course file. Okay, so this is a good way to store your course file. Now, what format does it store this file in? It's actually stored in the Moodle format. So you can always restore it and you can show your auditors, etc., for the the content in this file. So it will store all the data, all the interaction data, everything will be stored here. Okay, so once you're done, suppose I don't want to enroll users, I click here because I just want to restore it. You go to the next. Don't jump to final step. It will go through the various contents here. And for example, if you don't want to include a quiz or an assessment, you can just untick. Sometimes most of the lecturers don't want to include the midterm examination because obviously you will have a new uh, midterm course question paper. So you can remove that if you have it over here. So this will ask you what to restore. So if you don't want something, you can just unclick or you click. Then you go to next. And then it asks you again because it's doing its due diligence going through its entire procedure. And finally, you reach here and you do a perform backup. Once you perform a backup, it will create a file. Okay. Okay, so the backup file is created successfully, which is in the JTMK uh, server. It's This is not in your PC as yet. It's on the JTMK server. And then I click on continue. Okay. Okay, now... What you have here is your backup file. So this is the file, Wednesday, 23rd March, you can see here. I have backed it up at this time. Now, you can do two things with this file. I would suggest that you do both to protect your data for your, uh, for your records as well as for your file. The first one is you click on download. When you click on download, the entire content will be saved in your machine, in your computer, in your whatever device you're using, it will be saved as a Moodle mobile file. Okay, so you'll you will save it as a Moodle file, as a MBZ file. Okay, so that's a format which is a zip. It's not like zip. You can only open it with a Moodle or a Moodle mobile app. Okay, this file. So this is uh, saved as a MBZ file. You just save it. Okay, just save and then you're done. So I'll just save this for reference. Save and then you're done. Now to protect your data again, I would suggest you go to your UMS uh, Google Drive and you upload this uh, file into your UMS Google Drive just for safe safekeeping under that particular folder. That's the procedure or the good practice with regard to the backup of the data. Now, suppose I want to restore this file or restore it into a new semester. For, in order to do this, your new course should be ready in the system. So that usually happens in the week uh, preceding the lecture week. So you'll have one week before and then your e-learning coordinators and the center for e-learning will create your files. So what you do is once you have your file ready, you will have this backup area. So all you do is click on restore. Okay, so I clicked on download to save the file. I click on restore to restore that file. So when you click on restore, it will actually look for a destination. It wants to find a destination in which to store your entire content. So you have all your content here. So if you, if you, for example, if you modified a lecture or you, you created a new course synopsis, you can actually unclick and you can remove this out. So you just unclick it and then you don't restore that inside the system. So you just unclick whatever you didn't need to restore. You continue. Okay. And in this one, I need to find the course. Okay. So what I have is a course. So I have a course here, which I've created, which is a dummy course. It is called a backup just for demo. Okay, I search, hopefully it can be found in the system. Okay, we have a course, dummy course here, which I call backup and restore. It's just for demonstration for the purpose of the roadshow. But in your case, this will be your course with your respective course code, course title, session and semester. You will see that. So you'll have to key that in because 
the uh, Moodle learning management system is not like Google. It's not intuitive. It won't pick up the um, text fields and the uh, these fields as a intelligent search engine. You'll have to key in and ensure that you uh, maintain the uh, case the case as well as the uh, text, or else it will uh, back up to something else. But don't worry about this because, as a lecturer, you will only have access to your course. So once you have this course, you just select it. Okay, search on backup course, and I click on continue. Again, it will ask me all these uh, things, uh, data which I need to upload. So if you have users, you can exclude. Of course, I won't have users because I am not migrating their data. You click on next. Okay, then it asks you to override. So you want to override, you override the course configuration, which means that it will follow exactly what is in the previous course. Then you give it a course start date. So I can give it a course start date. For example, if I want to start the course on 23rd, we'll put it as today, 23rd of March, 2022. And we have this here, so we'll override this. So we have all the content here. Everything is done, I go to next. And if there's any parameter which you have not filled in, it will remind you here. If not, you just perform restore. So that is a backup. Now we are migrating to restore. Okay, continue. Okay, now you can see this course. Okay, so this is the original course. And this was the backup and restore. Okay, so now I have backup this course. Now suppose you have found out that once you have backup and restore this course that you don't want to have certain content inside. Okay, all you need to do is go back to that course and you can see this course has users is only uh, me who is a content creator. There's nobody else here. So this is the module one copy and then we can basically uh, remove content which we don't want to. For example, I just turn editing on. And I don't want to have these uh, lecture one chat or whatever. I just remove this out. Okay, so this is the way you back up and restore. So please do this at the commencement of every semester because it will save you a lot of time. Do you have any questions regarding backup and restore? You can post in the chat or you can turn on your microphone. If there are any questions, uh, you can post at any time, you can interrupt me at any time because some of the procedures which I described may be uh, new to you or some of the element may not uh, be difficult to comprehend. Okay, So if you have anything, you just uh, post in the chat or turn on the microphone. Okay, so let's go back to our course here, which is, was our IPMB Roadshow 2022 here. So it's here. Okay, so in this course, we see the enrollment. So we have enrolled users. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So these are the enrolled users. Now, with these users, I can do multiple things. Now, suppose I want only a suppose I'm teaching a mixed batch of students, means I have uh, students from one faculty and another faculty, and they're joining my course as an elective course. So I can actually assign them a, a way to log in for the course. So I don't have un. Uh, who is unsolicited users. So we sometimes students will register for the course. This is also another problem which uh, ha we have been informed about, like students from second year will register for the first year, will register for second year course, second year will register for third year course. Why do they register? Because they want to download all the content. They will register for the course, download the content, and they will keep it, all the exam papers and quiz, etc., etc. So they will have access preview. So to prevent it, we actually have a, system to lock so what you do is you click on users here okay and then you go to enrollment methods okay and you add a method which is known as self enrollment okay so there are three steps you choose an enrollment method and self enrollment okay now when you create a self enrollment method it's actually creating what is known as an instance so we have to give it a name so enroll and then you put your course code and you put, uh, for example, semester session. So your student will know when you distribute this uh, enrollment key to the student, they will know this is the course and this is the WhatsApp. Uh, you can send by WhatsApp or the Moodle mobile, the course code, uh, the enrollment key and the course code. So you allow en existing enrollments, yes, because you have already enrolled. If I click this on no, it will uh, basically remove 
all the previously enrolled users. So usually you have yes, allow new enrollments, yes. And then this is what you need to give them is the enrollment key. Now what's going to happen is that from now onwards, once I click on save this, everyone else who joins this particular session and wants to enroll for this course, they will have to use the enrollment key or else they cannot enroll for the course. Okay, it will block users. So this is one way to prevent unauthorized access to your course. So define, define role as student. So if I want everyone to become a teacher, I can do it as well. And then there is another one for exams because uh, based on the e-learning experience, most of the exams for final exam were conducted online. So I just make them a student. You have enrollment duration so that students don't enroll. We can enable this uh, and so on and so forth. But these are things which is entirely up to you. So sometimes lecturers don't want the students to join after week two, then you can uh, enable all this. So thank you for enrolling. For the course, you can add in your YouTube video introduction here and so on and so forth, and you add method. Okay, so that means now from now onwards, whoever wants to enroll will have to use the enroll the click on the link, but it'll ask you for the key. So then your key is the one which you shared in the chat window, which is ABCD one two three four. Okay, so that's how we do it. So now we have users here. Okay, now the next thing which we do after we enroll the users is to prevent them from unenrolling. So this is a this is another issue which is being faced by uh, by lecturers as well students enroll for the course and sometimes in the mi middle of the semester or something they will decide to unenroll without any logic or maybe they are confused or they click on the wrong link okay now when a student unenrolls for the course be very careful with this it actually affects both the student and us because our course file gets the course file the content related to the student will get deleted everything from attendance uh, of course attendance in OB but if you're using this system for attendance their assignments quiz uh, their analytics will all get deleted once they enroll so the way you block that is by using permissions so you click go to the users okay I'll show you again so users uh, usually what the student will do is on users they will click unroll unenroll me here maybe they do by mistake or I don't know how but uh, to prevent this, you click on users and then you go to permissions, okay, and then you check permissions. So, in this, you will see many, many, many permissions, okay. So, there will be guest access and okay, okay, okay. So, what I'm going to do is I will scroll down slowly so that you don't get confused. So, you can see the category enrollment, so and so. You scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, and then you click here, okay. So in this one, you see manual enrollments. Okay, unenroll users from the course. There's something here. Okay, so you can see here unenroll users from the course and unenroll self from the course. So in both these cases, student has been given the priority. So what you need to do to prevent students from unenrolling self from the course, you click here, delete, remove. Okay. Now, only the teacher can unenroll you from the course. Please be careful with this because uh, uh, in many cases, the lecturers will come and say the student unenrolled by accident and can you enroll him or her again? He, they can unenroll un again, but all the data is gone. Okay, Then, this, then we can't uh, help you in that because uh, a certain amount of administrative control we have over the system, but we give the lecturer the uh, privilege of having that full administrative control with regard to the content. So we can't help you with that because there won't be any backup of that student's data in the system once you unenroll. So you click here, man manual enrollment, unenroll cell from the course, and then only teacher can be, uh, do this. Okay, you can also add here, if you want to add your teacher, course creator, manager, you can add them as the person who can unenroll. Usually in our case with UMS, we only have the uh, lecturer or the teacher, what is known as the teacher and the student and the Pengawa, uh, Pegawas exam. And we also may have a tutor. If you have a tutor, you can add them here. Okay, so that's how we settle this one. So once it's done, it's saved automatically by default, and then we go back to the users themselves. Okay, so you have the users list here. So I'll go back to the course itself, and we go back to the next functionality, which is related to user, which is the grouping. Now, in the system, we have the 
ability to assign students to groups. Okay, now we have only few of us registered or enrolled here. So we actually we have this course and we have people and we can assign them to groups. Okay, so suppose I want to assign you into two groups. So I have only one, two, three, four, five, six users. And of course, the lecturer cannot be assigned to the group, so you can actually assign users into groups. So if you want to uh, create groups, you create groups. Here, you click on the groups button here, icon here, and you can create groups. Now, the system can create groups using two options. One is auto create, one is to create it manually. Okay, let's uh, try the simplest feature, which is auto create. So you don't get, you get an unbiased distribution of gender and cognitive ability. So I just auto create group. So click auto create group. It last you the group is called what? So I say group at IPMB and we have only a few users. So we just have two groups. So if you have more, you can create, but in our database, we only have two. select members with role student, allocate members randomly. Or you can do it by alphabetical order and you submit. Okay. Now you have created a group of two. So you have group A, IPMB. So we have these members and then we have group B and these members. Now, what if you want to remove or uh, add users? You can do here. Yeah, I won't do it now because we only have three and three. So sometimes if you want to distribute uh, by gender equally, you can actually do a uh, gender distribution here. Okay. So you have a group created and you can also create your own group okay so we have groupings and you can create a grouping okay now remember when you give an assignment once you select a group if you have an assignment you can actually assign the group leader to submit the assignment purely on the base of basis of the group so this is the way grouping is done okay but what happens in cases where your students are not uh, want a more democratic approach they don't want to be part of a group they, or they want their own setting. So what you do is you click on add an activity or resource here. And now you have uh, ability to create groups based on the democratic setup, which is a group self selection. Add. And then you have this group. So IPMB groups. Okay, so you create an IPMB group. You give it a description. So you in this you have to give your criteria and your basically your rules of engagement for this group. So you'll have to say this group is working on, for example, aquaculture and it will divide it into two parts. One will be handling water quality, other one will be handling the fish biology and so on. You can have the criteria here. Displayed, always do this by as a good practice for everything. Display description on the course page in order to enable all of these content to be seen in the first loading system, uh, of the page. Okay, so when the page loads, they will see everything as it is. If you don't click on this, what will happen is they will load the page, but they can't see everything. So they will click and load, click and load. And then somewhere down the line, if the internet connection is bad, they will lose the connection with the system. And then they will complain saying, we can't see the page. So as a good practice, always display description on the post page. Okay, so I will save this. Just click here. So the date of the course selection, usually we keep it open. Uh, sorry, the group selection, I can keep it open for one week so that the students don't change the groups later on. So I just keep it open from 23rd March, for example, to 30th March. That's the time at which you have the groups. Okay, minimum members per group will be three and you can set up maximum members per group also three. I'm not going to increase it because as I, as I can see, only three have registered. So that's it. So you select everything. And you can do uh, activity completion. So this is the one where you need to click on students can manually mark the activity as complete. The other ones you don't change because they are mostly related to the admin, which doesn't be effective. So if you want the activity to be complete, if you give them a deadline, say, for example, you must select your group by 30th of March, you select here. So you save and display. So now you can see the group members who are already here. So I have assigned you to groups, but you have the right to. You can go here. You can actually click on your link, which is IPMB group. You can click on that and you can select which group you want to belong to. You can exit groups. Okay, so this is um, was made. This feature was provided because uh, lecturers uh, or students don't want to be assigned to certain groups because of their own personal criteria. So. We give it, we give them that opening, but we limit it to a certain group. 
okay, we limit it to a certain duration. So later on, we don't have that problem whereby the student says, oh, my colleague was not uh, not contributing and I'm contributing everything. And so to prevent that, we created a group. So once you create your group, you assign to it, later on, don't change it. So you can't change this later on unless the lecturer does it manually. Now, the next thing, next feature, which is there in the system is the chat feature. So add an activity or resource and you have chat. You add a chat and I create a chat for IPMB chat. So is this chat open all the time? Uh, no, because of the, it's not like Discord server because Discord server and others, you leave it open all the time. So you can give them a time to chat here, which is a chat session in your lecture. For example, you want to discuss something, you can have a chat session here. This is a text only chat. There is no audio messaging. Okay, so you can make a chat session. For example, 23rd March, we have a chat session, for example, from 10.30 onwards to um, some time which you specify. So maybe usually nowadays because of the way we are teaching, we will have a one hour lecture, maybe a one hour video presentation. Then we have maybe a 30 minute chat session. So that's where you have your chat session. Now, usually based on our experience with our students, they are usually will not uh, interact much, usually out of the class of 10 or 12, uh, students out of a class of 100 may interact okay so that's the challenge so the way you engage them is by posing questions in chat so you pose them questions then they will be engaged this is a unique thing about e-learning which i observe in ums there's almost no interaction uh, during the lecture sessions okay either students are turning on their uh, system or because they have the privilege of having the recording so because of the recording, they don't really have to attend the lecture. They will just come in and go on and so on and so forth. Okay, now there are different um, things over here. If you want to force the students to um, chat, you can actually put a restriction here. So they will only, uh, but I won't do it now, but I will show you how it's done because we need to have two modules. So completion tracking, you show activity as complete when conditions are met. This way you can track the student's chat and then you save and display. Now the chat is actually available now. So any of you, if you want to try it out, you just click on the IPMB chat icon, which you will see, and a chat box will open, okay? So a chat box will open, click here to enter the chat now, and you'll see a chat box. I don't know if you can see it in your system, but you should see a chat box, and then it'll say hello, okay? And then it'll send a chat out. Now, what happens if someone is uh, sends you a chat when you're offline? Okay, I just close this. I just, you can click and you can try it out. What happens if someone sends you a chat when you're offline is you will see a bubble here. Okay, on, in this bubble here, you will see the um, cloud over here. You will see whoever is chatting with you in the offline mode. Okay, so you, please use this feature because it enables you to have interaction. And I'm introducing it to you because later on when we have the 40, 40, 20 criteria for audit, this will be one of the element which you can use. Okay, now, how to prevent students from um, communicating with you outside of uh, the system. Okay, so Moodle mobile is, okay, now uh, we are using the chat, uh, the chat using WhatsApp or Telegram or other, th other applications, right? So you don't have to do that. You actually have what is known as a Moodle app. Okay, so we will try and open it here. Okay, I'll open this here, but it uh, you can download it on your device. So this is the Moodle app. So you go to your Play Store or your uh, Google uh, Play Store, the app stores, and you can download this app in your system. It is free unless you have the uh, other, uh, these are other options, but the app is actually free. All you need to do is log in with your current user ID and password. And then you can, whatever is in the, your system, you can see it in Moodle mobile app. Now, most of the students, they will be using this app because it's more uh, mobile friendly as compared to the system. They can access all the content from our smart V3 on the Moodle mobile app, okay? Including interaction and chat. So it's a good option and you should use it because uh, you can get your documentary evidence by printing out all the content for your course file. Okay, that's why we say use the Moodle mobile app as opposed to WhatsApp. Okay, so that's about the app itself. I just close this, so try and use it. So we go back to the system itself and we uh, explore the other features. So we have the chat feature and the group feature. 
Let me show you the next feature. So I will add an activity resource and this is called a external tool. Okay, now what happens when we are doing our attendance online is that we have to sometimes show the QR code and or share the link and students will not have that option because in many cases, sometimes the OER system will display the QR code. So before the lecture starts, I have to display it and so on and so forth. So some of the lecturers are using this external tool. Okay, so let me go to web apps. Okay, I just show you how it's used so you can use it for web apps for the OB system. You can access everything here using the external tool. You can access your OER, your OBs, your external tool. Basically, even a Padlet, you can access. So this is our UMS OB system. Now I want to create this external tool here. Okay, so what I do is I click on copy here and I click here. Okay, let me create a lecture. I just created. So this is my OB system and this is my course. Okay, now I want to create attendance. I just so I have an attendance uh, system here. So what I do, I create my attendance here. For example, this is attendance. And I have to create a, I created lectures here for the attendance. So for example, if I have a lecture here, I can actually click on link. Okay, Go to link here. And you have to copy the link. So you copy link, copy the attendance link, and then you go back to your system. And then you go on external tool. Now you'll have to create an external tool for attendance for each and every lecture, but it will save you a lot of trouble because the student won't have, to, uh, you won't get disturbed in the middle of the lecture with the student saying, I cannot access the link and so on and so forth. So use external tool, which is the best thing which you can do. Okay, so there's a message in the chat. Okay, okay, so add. Okay, so here you have the activity tool, which is attendance. You need to state the date and time, uh, date and time. So this will be attendance for lecture, for example, automatic based on tool URL, and then you cl click here on the tool URL. Okay, so you click here. So this is your password. This one you don't click because it will set another default. So let the student view what they will see in the system itself. Okay, don't do anything else over here or it will create complication and then you save and display. Okay, now, this is what you will see in your system. Please don't click because you won't see it. Uh, you cannot access because you're not enrolled for that particular course. I've used my own live course now for the for the uh, attendance link. But what the student will see is the attendance here. They will, you have to guide them to this. Tell them to click on the link. Once they click here, what they will see is the login. So they will have to log in with their user ID and password. They can sign in and then the link is live. So you can click to check in. Now, this is the way how you use the external tool. You can insert almost anything in an external tool, including a Padlet. So suppose you have a Padlet. Okay, you have a Padlet account, which you want to use for, uh, for those of you who are using it earlier, may be aware that it was called Wallwisher. So if you want to create your Padlet, you can log in with your Padlet account and you can uh, just log in with a random account. Let's log in here. And then you can create without uh, having that going through that process for uh, like uh, asking the student log in, log out, it confuses people. So in this case, I can have a Padlet here. Okay, and I copy it, block. Yeah, I just copy this just for example. And I want to embed this in my course. Okay, so I just click here and I add an activity resource and I click an external tool, add. And this is called Padlet. Padlet chat. I click in the URL, okay, and that is save and display. Okay, now um, this is because uh, the student will actually have to click on the link because now I'm in a external tool for Padlet, so they will have to click in. Then it will ask you to uh, uh, re uh, log into that and so on and so forth. Okay, but this will take care of the process of having the registration. One minute, I just this is actually a link created by my colleague, so I don't have access to that, but you can create it over here. Okay, so I just go back to Padlet. Okay, if you're using this, you can make a Padlet. Okay, let me make a Padlet called a wall, and I call it for, okay, so I call it IPMB. Okay, and then I add everything else and so on and so forth. You can add the stuff. Okay, and then next, 
Okay, so your Padlet is set, and then I want to share this. Okay, so let me try this again. Create it here. Go back to external tool. Chat. I edit it. Or I create a new one. Okay, just add a new activity or resource. Add an external tool because many of the lecturers use Padlet. Unfortunately, now it is not free. Uh, it's only free for I think two ch uh, chats. So chat and I click a URL. Save and display. Okay. So again, you'll have to access this because IPMB I think has been a firewall. Usually I ask my student to click on the chat and they will go into the Padlet login and then they can communicate with me using the Padlet. So that's another option. But of course, as a a replacement for Padlet, we still have chat in this. Of course, chat is not so beautiful in terms of the content. It will have a very uh, basic white display, but if you use Padlet, you usually have better kind of like this. You'll have things like that, and you can start posting here. So you just click, and then you say hello, or so on and so forth. Okay, so and then you just publish so you can have padlet is good because you can post links and they will uh, auto display and so on and so forth so please use the padlet but of course it's limited it's not free limited to i think two or three um, padlets per session okay now you have your sessions here so another thing which you can add is your course synopsis so usually we add so i'm just showing you things one by one usually you have to add your course synopsis so add an activity or resource the first thing which we do is the course synopsis after we finish all our grouping and so on and so forth you add your course synopsis here okay, so you have your course synopsis okay now the student will not know what's table for so you have to mention its course synopsis you give the uh, your introduction Because uh, the word uh, table 4.2 is unique only to UMS. Other universities, they will use their own table, whatever it is at that version. But usually when we refer to it for students, we call it course synopsis. You drag and drop a file. So I've created a file here. So this will be the course synopsis. It's just a generic one. And you call it course synopsis, synopsis for the course. And you have your all rights reserved here. Don't make it public domain. If you make it public domain, everyone can download and use your table for, for their own course. Then they will just copy and paste. And you have a activity completion, which is students as to show activity as complete when conditions are met. Okay. And usually the other ones you don't change and you save and display. But this one, right, you can actually embed it into the system, which is here. Okay, display description on the course page and it should be embedded in the system as well. Save and display. Okay, so the, the, the system will actually embed the course synopsis in the system itself. So you'll see it embedded. There's no need to re-click on the system. Okay, so you have your course synopsis. Then you start adding your lecture notes based on the requirements. So there are two ways where I'll just check if the OER system is actually active now. So I can show you how you add lectures from OER. Okay. Let's refresh. Okay, no, it's not active. So if you have a, a system in the OER, right, or any lecture note, you can actually add it directly as a link from OER. So usually we add the um, lectures. For example, if you have a lecture recording like I have over here, you can actually insert it directly into the lecture as such. So you click on share here and you go to the embed code here. And then you copy the embed code. Okay. Hopefully you can see this window. You copy the embed code. You go back to your lecture note example here, which is here. Okay. And then you add an activity or resource. Now, if you want to uh, upload your video lecture from your previous year, you can actually add it as a page. Page gives you more uh, good dynamic view. Okay, so this is, for example, this is lecture one. I add it here. I click on here, this button here. Okay, so click on this button. Can you see uh, there's a keyboard? Click on the keyboard button here. And then you click on this greater than equal to sign, which activates the HTML code. Click here. 
and then you then you can copy your YouTube link here. Okay, and then display description on course page here. Usually you have to do it twice because the system actually looking for input on both the parameters. So you can see here. And now you have appearance. This one you don't change. You have a activity completion here, which is students must show the activity as complete when conditions are met, which means they have to watch your video. Then only you can view them as they will see their task bar saying they have completed that particular activity. And you can track them as well. If you don't do this, you cannot track your students' performance. So it should always show here. Okay. Now there is one very interesting button here which we use. It's called an add a restriction. Now suppose you have told a student, please read your course synopsis or download your course synopsis before your first lecture. But you are not sure whether the students are actually doing that or not. So you have you can put a restriction here. So I add a restriction. So they have to complete a specific activity. Okay. So activity as complete, you have to choose, for example, they cannot, oh, course synopsis. Okay. So only when they view the course synopsis, they can move on to the first lecture. You can actually do this as a cascade. So you can prevent students from viewing lecture two until they view lecture one and so on and so forth. Okay. So you can create a kind of a block block in the system. So the students uh, achieve their learning outcomes in a step by step manner. Okay. So you have course synopsis and then you save and display. Now, when you see a lecture, right? you will see the lecture note visible in the system. Okay, with regard to the lectures which are on YouTube, uh, please make sure that you do not violate the community, community, what is known as community guidelines, which is the display of the copyrighted material as well as the images of people without their consent. So that's what you need to do or else the channel gets flagged and stopped. Okay, so that's what it uh, is about. So now can you see the restricted icon here. So it says restricted, not available unless the activity course synopsis is marked complete. So the student will actually see this in their terminal. So they'll have to click on the course synopsis, uh, watch, read the course synopsis. Of course, we don't know whether they are reading or not, but you'll have to have the course synopsis complete. Okay. That's what we have here. So as a good practice, right, in terms of blended learning, it's always good to add a feedback for each lecture. So you add an activity or research, uh, resource and then you have a feedback here. So you have feedback. So this will be the uh, feedback for lecture one. You ask them to post a feedback here or give them marks for that and you can ask them to uh, you put a description for this and you can add a description on course page and you have a multiple buttons here which you can change. So usually we record the user's name with the answer. So we know who is posting. After submission, you can send a message. Thank you. Then you have your restrict access, no activity completion. If you want to force them to feedback, you can actually put a block saying that you cannot access the next lecture until you complete the feedback. Okay, you can do that, but you need to have two lectures. I'll show you how it's done. Students can manually mark the activity as complete. You show activity as complete when conditions are met and then you save and display. You, the, there are other functions here which are competencies and tags. Usually we don't use competency because competency is measured using the OBE based on the course learning outcomes. Tags is actually for this. So this will be feedback one. You can put a random tag. So the reason why we use these tags is because if you are, are teaching, for example, two or three courses per semester, some of us teach even four courses, and then you want to find out where, what is there, you can actually just search using the hashtag. So you can search your entire smart V3 system, and then you save and display. Now, once you have your feedback for lecture one, right, you still have to do one more uh, thing, which is you have to click on edit question, or else the student will not see a question. You can add a question in the form of long answer text, for example, or short answer text. So the student will be allowed to answer. So, for example, what have you learned from this lecture? Okay. For example, when you give it a label, so the student, the width of the label is the width of that particular page. I can increase the width. For example, I make it uh, 60. And the label will actually become bigger. That means they will, this is just a display uh, thing. So the students will see the entire label there. Number of lines you can increase or decrease and save question. 
Okay. So this is what the student will see. Now, if you go to your terminal and you click on that feedback, you will actually see a block which will open up and you will have a question there and you click answer the question. You will not see this as a student. You will see only the answer the question. Okay, and then you have the feedback from the lecture. Thank you, whatever, and then so forth. So it's a good practice to ask students to all provide feedback because that is part of the process of teaching and learning and course improvement. So you can actually collect all these feedbacks and put it in your uh, your course, um, what we call reflex, reflective note, because at the, in the MQA table, uh, uh, when we submit our course file, we actually have a section for the uh, reflection. So you can use all this feedback, compile them together and reflect on the feedback and how the course will be improved for the next cycle. Okay. So these things can be done uh within the context of improving the quality of teaching and learning okay so that's what we have here of course you have your assignment and so on and so forth but i want to show you now how the course is progressing and the analytics of the uh, analytics feature so i turn editing off okay i will go back to the analytics feature so if you have any questions you can ask me now uh in the system because i am using my screen so i can't See the chat. I just uh, turn open the chat. Uh, if you have any questions, you can please post them in the chat window. I will address or else you can just turn on your microphone. It's a sharing session. So please turn on your microphone and you can. Excuse me, Dr. Ken. Mabel yeah. here. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Mabel. Hi. Good morning. Thank you for your sharing. Yeah. It's a bit fast. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I understand because, why you need one, to one go. One second, Dr. Mabel. I just increased my volume. Huh? Because I was okay. Okay, you can. But um, I have a question uh, regarding the cost synopsis. Yeah. You mentioned about um copyright, but that was too quick. Can you just re replay yeah, yeah, that quickly? Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Sorry, Thank I have you. to go fast because you know why. Yeah. The I will tell you the reality is the blended learning uh thing, right? This blended learning is actually taking uh it requires about four days of uh, yeah, to yeah. Teach you the step. But we are given a limited time. Two so, hours. Two hours. So. <laughs> I have to cover right. up uh, whatever I can cover up. So yes, yes. We, we actually have this in the website. We have an ebook with all these instructions in step by step. So they are distributed and we will. Okay, one second. I just close this. And can you see, still see my screen? Yes. Okay, okay. So, okay, one second. This is WebEx, so we have to be careful not Google Meet. So, okay. So when you want to do your course synopsis, right? You turn editing on first. Okay. Mm. So it turns red and then you go back to your ad and activity or resource. Okay. So now it's the actually way... stop, stop at one, um, one it screen stops? It's showing okay, uh, okay. genetics and plant breeding only. Okay. 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 One second. Okay. So I'll have to do some kind of a. Can you see the Padlet screen, doctor? It's no. Okay. okay. Um, is it my screen? No, no. I think it's for all. Okay. Okay. This is the thing with no change from just now. It was yeah, working right? well. Yeah, moving yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, because of the uh, chat window. Chat window. One second. I have to okay. actually stop and restart. I have to stop and restart. Okay. So. It's blank this now, nothing. Thing, uh, mm. Yeah, this is the thing about uh, Cisco, the WebEx, and, and, and the Teams. If you uh, skip, right, suddenly it becomes. Okay, okay now? See, okay, yeah, that happened to me. Yeah, um, it says yeah, yeah. starting to share content. Mm, okay. You should see the OB system when it opens up. Still starting. <laughs> blank. It's a white screen now. Nothing. A bit slow. I yeah. don't know my connection. That's what happens with uh, this one. Actually, because before I start this uh, session, I have to uh, log in about 30 minutes before to set up the, the system or else it will hang. Okay. Start. And is it like uh, I use this too. Um, uh, you open up. It's, it's better to open up all the files that you will share and then just change the screen and then share that particular screen later on. Yes, Dr. Mabel, that's correct. That's what I did. I open up all the files, all the links. Actually, I tab them and I share the screen. I don't share the window because this is the problem with the system. It will, it will tend to hang if you open up multiple applications at the same time. Actually, the yeah, technical yeah. reason is because of the um, 
you know this it's using up a lot of the ram in the system unlike google meet so it will use up your processor so sorry yeah uh, one minute uh, it's going to mm. It's still a uh, white screen still, still, here. Still white screen, um, right? Okay, so while we're waiting, can I ask you about the attendance? Yeah. So is it well, better? Um, because what I do is I, I open up the OBE and then copy the link and copy that link to yeah. the WhatsApp. So I don't have to open up uh, the, what do you call, the smart tree all the time. Oh, okay. At okay, the end okay. of the day, I can still download the, the um, entire attendance from OBE itself without like having to do so much extra in the smart tree, right? Oh, okay. The 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 system, right? The OBE will record the attendance. Yeah. But the reason why I do that step in the smart tree is because some of the lecturers, they may not want to, the, the how, do, how do I say it? It's the smart tree will not record attendance. Okay. It will only allow the students to access the OBE through the smart tree. So uh, this is because some of the oh, lecturers, right? Oh, you want right? to access? Uh, I mean, you want to record the smart tree attendance? Uh, no, the, the smart tree will not record attendance. We, of yeah. course, there's an attendance option, but we need to use OBE, right? Okay, but this is what happens with some of the lecturers. They will be giving the lecture online using the using your WebEx, and suddenly the student will say, oh, I cannot access the OBE, and, and I cannot access the link, and so on and so forth. So to prevent that from happening, we actually create that uh, system whereby you use an external tool. So the external tool is actually here, so they will have to do their own, uh, like uh, like login and so on and so forth. So it works for some lecturers. It works for it doesn't work for some. So uh, if you're following that uh, practice, Dr. Mabel, it's it's good enough. Don't don't change it. Okay. okay so this is just for enabling those because uh, majority of lecturers use external tool for attendance recording in the system. So oh, that's okay, actually I'll try yeah. that. But um, I found that um, no problem with my current approach. So. Yeah, don't, don't change it. If, if there's no problem. But if the external change. problem is one of the code 1732, which one is it? Uh, it will come. Uh, okay, look to, the... we'll have to look at the PHP. So basically, if you want to find out this, you just click on the editor. So add an activity resource. Okay. If it's very easy to find out what's. Oh, yeah, this is, yeah. Because this okay. is actually under activities or resources. So if you add a. Uh, the uh, external tool right it will come as an activity it will be ca captured under the it's the three, three. okay, so oh, okay. it will be captured under three so i think that's also option maybe that's the reason why the lecturers use it because it's still captured as an activity so it'll be captured under more the than three. enough if you're doing this for every week yeah more <laughs> than enough yeah but the idea was to that, that's what I mentioned. It, it's working now because we are still following 1732. But once we migrate to the 40, 40, 20, uh, then they will count the interaction as well. How soon is that likely this uh, session? No, 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 not this next one. We session? have to actually, yeah, next, oh. because the Senate approval is, we are waiting for the Senate to approve that. Okay. There have been uh, some, uh, I think, challenge oh, from uh, different dean have different options. So. Uh, opinion sorry so we'll have to wait for everyone to consensus okay so i'll show you the uh, synopsis dr mabel so that's so you add an activity or resource so you have to convert your table uh, four point to the stage i'm okay i just want to know okay. the part where you said uh, the copyright okay. because uh, it, yes. in my mind um yeah. if the student downloaded this uh, table four yeah so how does the copyright uh, player its role there functions okay so this is course synopsis right so you yeah. upload here your description etc and then you click here and you select your file now the thing about uh, the uh, thing is copyright so i'll have to do that i have to still upload hmm. a file okay else you cannot see that particular element okay, so open okay now the reason why this is actually the the table 4.2 Two, right is actually mm -hmm. the, uh, is the material belonging to ums it's ums content so usually we use okay. that all rights reserved because we have not obtained a copyright for that now suppose you uh, selected any of these other ones right public uh -huh. domain creative contribution uh, creative commons etc etc what it means is that anyone can download that table 4.2 and reuse it for their own university or their course so if the student for example is lecture in other university they mm -hmm. can download it create a new course and get all the content free uh, then they will they, they will submit to mqa so when mqa says uh, you you download it it's similar to ms they'll say no the lecturer has actually put it as creative commons or public domain 
So we use all rights reserve, which means that nobody can reuse this content again. Uh, does it actually appear anywhere on the document once the document is downloaded? Uh, we can actually before. track whether it has been reused by uh, using the analytics in the system, the server. But it does not Only appear. Only if in the they document. use the same system, right? Yeah, we can. But whoever, for example, if they have been, okay, for example, there's a legal issue like somebody has reused their table 4.2 and they have copied and paste in their course, right, in other university, and it becomes a legal issue. We can actually track that uh, usage from the log files, so we can find out who has downloaded that log file and so on and so forth. So. This gives it traceability, so we can trace back that file. But um, it how won't... about the? Okay, sorry. Yeah. The, how about the? Uh, other files that we upload, like our uh, lecture notes. So can we actually okay. do the same? All other lecture notes reason? will be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So for the lecture notes, it's like this. So the. Okay, I will show you the the uh, smart tree later on. Okay, but for lecture yeah. notes, I will show you first. So if you put all rights reserved, it means no one can reuse your lecture, but you have no control over that because you will not know if they are reusing. Okay, so but if there is a legal challenge, suppose you found out someone is reusing your lecture without your consent, okay, then you can take them to court if you have used all rights reserved because all rights reserved means you have uh, you have retained the rights for that lecture. The other one is public domain; everyone can reuse. And then there are other ones which are Creative Commons, which are basically allowing people to reuse your content subject to certain conditions okay like no no commercial no use no derivatives no derivatives means you can't change so for that we have a specific uh, training on creative commons licensing so if you decide to use creative commons you have to select the choice but creative commons uh, gives everyone the right to reuse your material and share it so for this one we select uh, all rights reserved and then you upload the file so that's uh, basically what you see now coming down to the bottom right if you scroll down to the bottom of the smart v3 right you have a license here <laughs> this is the overarching license which is cc by non-commercial so what this means is that the content in this site except the one which is uh, having that all rights reserved so if you have selected all rights reserved that overrides this particular um, license. Okay, what it means is Creative Commons, which means all your lectures can be downloaded, they can be shared, but they cannot be commercialized. Which means that if you, someone took your course and then they marketed it as a paying course in other university, then you can take legal action against them because this is a non-commercial content. Okay, and it also reflects back on us because when we use content. It should be either from public domain or creative commons. So we can't use copyrighted material. For example, see if I shared this uh, slide, right? Okay. Okay. Suppose I shared this. Okay. You can see this image and all that in the, in the slide. This is in a video, but the images are from the creative commons. Okay. So I've used office 365 to create this lecture, but the image from creative commons. Okay. Have you, uh, do you know how to use that feature Dr. Mabel in office 365? I think at some stage, yeah, but I haven't used it for a while, so yeah. I think it just needs some practice. Yeah, yeah so in don't, Office... Don't worry about it now, yeah. Yeah, in Office 365, this feature is there whereby you can use images which are Creative Commons. So, mm -hmm, okay. you, can, you don't have to worry about the licensing and so on and so forth because it's already in the system. Okay, so that covers the uh, the thing about copyrights and... Right, uh, thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Dr. Mabel. Any other question related to... What has been covered? So we'll see the people who are here. So more have re registered. Now I will show you one feature which is there in the system related to the analytics. Now suppose you are delivering a lecture online and you don't really know whether students are working on the, uh, on the lecture or they are doing other stuff or maybe alternatively, you want to track the students who are lagging behind in your class. What happens in this thing? There is something known as an analytics feature. So again, I will start by closing this first, so you know where I, where I am. So you'll have your administration block. So you go to your course administration, and then you scroll down here to see reports. Okay. So you'll see the reports here, and then you expand. Now in the reports, you will see many things which are relevant to you for your course file as well as for attendance record. There are actually log files which record the students' logs of attendance and so on and so forth. There are also log files which, when you are doing, when you are conducting exams midterm. Please ensure that you check your log files for that midterm session so you can find out who has logged in from where and what they are doing in your server. 
Okay, so, but what we are interested in, in for lecturers is you want to see information as such in a graphical format. For this, under the reports, there is actually a button called as analytics graphs. Okay, now we are conducting this session. That's why I ask you all to enroll because I can show you what's actually happening in the system. Okay, let's look at number of active students. So I click here and a window will open. Okay, now you can see the number of active students in the class by seeing the, clicking on the link. So you can see nine o'clock, there were six, 10 o'clock, there are five active students. And at 10 o'clock, you can click here and it shows you who has logged in, logged out and so on and so forth. Okay, now what this system does, one second, I close this, is it tracks the users based on the clicks of the mouse. Okay, so suppose you have here, so suppose we have um, Dr. Mabel is here recording. Uh, she is actually uh, viewing course, viewing course module, up uploading course, updated course module, right? All of you are actually clicking on the mouse. So the system is recording the clicks per mouse. Okay, so clicks for each mouse. So if you have 10 students using 10 different mouse elements, they will click, uh, click on the link here. Okay, so this is what you see in the system. Now, suppose I want to look at content access. Again, I go back to reports, analytics graphs, and I see the content access. Okay, now because this is only being done today, which means that we have just uh, started using the system, it may not show you. So, uh, just I will just show you. So, you click on all. Suppose you want to find out who, which students are using chat, uh, feedback, forum, etc., 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 you will see here. Okay, so build graph. Okay, build graph. So this one was actually uh, looking through the whole system, identifying all the uh, access, and then it's building a graph for your reference. Okay, so that's what it does. So this one takes a bit of time. So it will show you a graph of the access to the system. That's what it does. So you will know who, for example, students uh, have watch your video or not, you will know by watching this. Currently, it won't show up because I think it's um, just new. So we have just uh, started using it. Usually, you need to use the system for about a day before it shows up. Okay, that showed up. So now it's showing you the current access. So announcements was accessed by one and not accessed by the rest. IPMB group, okay. So IPMB chat three have tried. Attendance one has tried. So this is showing you the way in which the system is being uh, accessed or interacted with by the students. Now, this will not be important at this stage, but it will be important later on when we go in for the implementation of the interactive 40, 40, 20. Uh, they, you will need to uh, basically look at this graph. Okay, so I just go back. It's easier to go back. So let's see again who's active in the course. <laughs> just I just show you for. Uh, so if you have clicked, right, just click on anything. And I will show you the activity will increase if you click. Just click. If you're on the system, just click and then, okay. Okay, now see, there are 33 clicks. So 33 uh, of you have actually clicked on the course at some point in the system. Okay. So this is a, just a, it's like a fancy tool, but it's good to determine what's happening in your system at any given time because we are so engrossed with the content delivery, right? Sometimes we don't have access to the students. Uh, some of the students, for example, who are not performing well in the midterm, I did an analytic search and I found out that these are the students who are not active in the system. So you can actually use that to determine student activity. Okay, so we have learned how to put up the lecture. Assignment, I'm sure you are all familiar with, so I won't cover that. I will cover the quiz, okay, and I will cover something known as the ICANN format. Okay, I just log out from my system first and I show you ICANN. Now I don't know how many of your how many of you actually used something else. Okay. I don't know how many of you uh, actually use the quiz uh, in the system because based on on our experience with the system, uh, many of the lecturers do not use prefer to use the quiz in Smart V3. And primarily the reason for that is because the quiz is actually based on a clock. The clock is based on a JTMK server. So if the student is in the Kampung somewhere far away, if they're in the Asrama, it's okay. But if they're in the Kampung somewhere and the, and the internet is slow and they cannot access that server, so they will actually have the quiz completed and they will not get any marks because the quiz will run faster than they can access it. So 
some of the lecturers prefer to use Google Forms. But when you use quiz in this system, you can actually capture the score. So let's see how a quiz is actually done. I'll pick a week and I'll add an activity or resource. I'm going to add a quiz. Okay, so I call it quiz and I add this activity or resource. Okay, now this is a quiz. You need to give a description for the quiz and a descriptor. So you need to add all your uh, metrics, your scoring methodologies, your rubric, everything inside this particular descriptor or else the student will not get a clear information. If you have negative marking, you need to add it here. So display description on the course page and then you have timing. Uh, okay, so you can, this is where the students will uh, have, usually you have a complaint regarding the timing because for example, okay, let's see the case where I open the quiz from 11 o'clock this morning, so 11.00 to 12.00, okay, okay, I enabled this time for instance, and your students are distributed across, some are in KK with a uh, good, good network, some may be in Kota Belud or uh, Tuaran somewhere, and then the network is slower, and some are in Asrama on campus, so the network is fast. Now, when you enable this, what happens is that if you had 10 questions, oh, and then you had one hour, some of the students who are on campus will have an advantage. Whereas some of them who are in the Kampung, if you had 30 questions in one hour, they will have a disadvantage because they will have a problem with the timing. But as an uh, educator, in terms of we need to actually create some level of difficulty means in terms of the time, we can't keep the quiz open continuously, right? So you need to have a time limit for that. So you have to enable this. So usually you have to be fair. And based on your uh, understanding of the subject experience, usually you can keep, keep the quiz open for a specific time. Okay, so attempts usually if you if you if you said this right, you are creating more stringency. So attempts must be submitted before time expires or they are not counted. Then you enable it becomes more stringent. Okay, so sometimes earlier when the internet was slow, we actually had this uh, enable the grace period, but then you have to disable all those. So you have to be judicious when you set the condition for quiz. Now, this is important for grade, okay? Now, suppose you go to your table 4.2, and then you have your formative and summative assessment. Usually your summative will be 20 to 40 for your final exam, and then your formative will be all those marks which you give for quiz, assignment, interaction, and so on and so forth. Now, in order to enable your, in order to ease your work, ease your burden of compiling all the marks, you can actually set up a grade category for this, okay? So you can have your grade category here and you can set a grade to pass. For example, you can set uh, 10 marks to pass, attempts allowed unlimited or one attempt, and you can set up a grading method based on the highest grade, okay? So you can have your grade category here and you set it up. Now, this is important so that you can get a final mark for your quiz and you don't have to keep on scaling it back using Excel. Then you have your layout for your quiz. Okay, this is another uh, thing which I should uh, bring uh, you up to date or give you a heads up on this is the layout. Now, if you have a 10 question quiz, a quiz with 10 questions, you will have a layout which shows so 10 questions on one page, which means the student will load one time and they will see all the 10 questions in one page. Now this, for some uh, educators, this will be, will be cognitive overload. But in terms of our internet accessibility, in Sabah especially, it's better to show the questions all on one page rather than doing every question on one page. If you, if you selected this option, the student will have to click and every time they click, if they don't connect to the internet, you will have a problem because if their bandwidth is low, their network is slow, they will definitely have a problem and you will get complaints when it comes down to every question. So usually I will select this 10 questions for the quiz, all the 10 questions in one page, one loading operation. They click once, they complete the quiz and they finish it uh, as uh, one go. Another disadvantage of this is if your student is having WhatsApp, they will snap the they will complete the quiz, snap, send it to their colleague. Okay, so this is where the ethics and honesty of the student comes. We cannot comment on that, but I'm only uh, mentioning this in terms of the network capability. Okay, question behavior is usually shuffle, usually shuffle within questions. So students don't see the same question, and then you have a 
deferred feedback. So this is a deferred feedback, which means that you will give the feedback to the students like congratulations only after they complete all the questions. Then you have review options. Okay. Now this one is uh, you don't change this generally. Appearance is uh, you can have a student's image. This is also optional. Extra restriction on attempts. Okay. Now this one you need to set, especially in Saba. Okay. Because of the again for network speed. Now suppose the student says, "I had a network problem. I really could not access the quiz," and you decide to give it. You need to give it them a key. So you give it a key A B C D one two three four. Usually it will ask you for the hashtag and lowercase and so on and so forth. You give it a key like this. Okay. So this one, which means that if the student really has a problem. And they want to redo the quiz, you can give them the password so they can reattempt the quiz. Okay, but make sure that you do it judiciously because again, the likelihood of uh, being dishonest increases. They can share the key with somebody else and they can basically attempt the quiz again. Okay, so this is the overall feedback. So usually the feedback is given to the students, which is if they get a grade boundary. Usually lecturers won't do this, but they will say well done and so on and so forth based on the grade boundary. So you can set a grade boundary, for example, zero to uh, zero to fifty. Please retake the quiz, and you can everything above fifty. You say uh, congratulations, or so and so forth. So you can set this up. You have common module settings, restrict access, no, but you can restrict access. For example, if you tell a student, you can only uh, complete the quiz when you uh watch lecture one okay i said this restriction so this is a restriction which says the student has to watch lecture one before they complete the quiz activity completion usually is when conditions are met which means it's completed when they actually complete it now this is an important button in terms of analytics if you do not set this you cannot track so it should always be here in the default so that you can track the progress of the Students uh, in the course. Okay, then you have tags and so on and so forth. You save and display. Now, what happens is that I will show you the uh, general page. What happens is once you set a quiz, a quiz is actually a instance. Instance, which means that you have created a module called quiz, but you have not added questions to that quiz. You need to add questions independently. Now, I'm going to go a little bit slow on this because. There are two ways to add questions. One is to build a question bank, and one is to import questions from an external source. Okay, I'll show you. Okay, now suppose you are a person, a lecturer who is very busy, and you're going to have to create questions each and every time all over again. So it's going to become very tedious for you. What I suggest to you is to create questions using something known as an I can format. Okay, this is an I can format. You don't require any software for this. You just open your Notepad. Okay, I don't think you can see my Notepad if you if I open it here. Okay, uh, but I will show you how it's done using this feature. Okay, so just, um, my Notepad. One second, give me a second. I'll open Notepad for you. So. Okay, so this is uh, you will not be able to see the notepad because of the restriction on the WebEx system. Okay, this is actually the I can format. Okay. What you need to do is you need to copy this format exactly as it is. You need to follow this format in order to generate the quiz. Okay, so what we do is this is the question. What is the correct answer to this question? This is the question. You need to follow it exactly as it is. And then you need to use only these characters A, B, C, and D. You can go in, of course, uh, up to Z. You can use this, but make sure you follow this uh, format. So there will be A followed by the dot, and then you leave a space, and then this is the first choice, second choice, third choice, and so on and so forth. Okay. And then the answer here. So you have answer here, colon, and space and d okay as long as you follow this you can key in 100 questions and i can format in a notepad and it's saved okay save it in a notepad format and your i can file is ready for upload now this is another option given to you which is 
answer A, you can also use the parentheses, the bracket, the close bracket here. These are the things. But the problem with I can write is that if you miss out anything, if for example, if you didn't leave this space or if your dot was not correct, it uh, the system will not uh, execute the question. It will not execute the quiz. It will give you an error. So you can use I can format, but you need to use it very carefully. Okay, so I will create I can file here. So okay, I'm going to create it. So I have a notepad. I don't think you can see my notepad, but I'm going to copy this and I'm going to save it as I can just for example. Okay, all you need to do is copy it, paste it in notepad and you can format your questions based on that. Now, when you save your notepad file, you save it as file. You save it as a text file. Those of you who are using a notepad, you can save it as uh, I can. Not txt. Okay, those of you are familiar with notepad because now hardly anyone uses notepad, but you can save it as a dot txt file and you save it as a utf8 encoding okay there's a in notepad there's something known as utf8 as an option there so you encode it as utf8 okay uh, you can't currently see my notepad because it's open on a different screen so i save it and i will show you the notepad once it is uh, in the system okay. okay now once you have created the questions in icon format you can actually go back to your quiz this is your quiz and I'm going to click on edit this quiz. Okay, so I have my quiz ready. I click and save and display and then it shows you here and I click on edit quiz. Now, when you click on edit quiz, you can start adding your questions. So click on edit quiz. I will show you both the ways in which you can add questions. Okay. Now, the most, uh, how do you say, the most tedious way to add the quiz is to add, for example, the question individually. If you edit the question individually, of course, you will have a challenge because uh, it'll, it is time consuming unless you have a tutor who will help you to add a question. So usually we add ourselves. So the maximum grade for this quiz is 10 marks. So that uh, that follows your table 4.2 Okay, for this one. So for example, if your table 4.2 had 5 marks for the quiz, then you can change it to 5. If you had 10 marks for the quiz, you change it to 10. So if you had two quizzes, of 10 marks each, you can create two quiz, 10, 10 marks, your grade book will give you the output. Now you click on save. Okay, so you save it once you're done. Now what we do is we add questions one at a time. So you click here, add, and then you can create a new question. You can uh, add from question bank, or you can add a random question. So let's create a new question. Now when you create a new question, it gives you multiple options. One is to have a multiple choice, MCQ, one is to have true, false, matching, so on and so forth. You have multiple choices over here. Now, for this one, multiple choice, true, false, matching, you it, the system is automated. But suppose you edit essay, uh, then you will have to mark yourself because the, the system is not, in, in fact, no system is intelligent enough to detect an essay type question. Okay, so you, for some of them, it's automated. Some of them, it is not. This one as well, select missing words. So let's try MCQ, simple one. So add, okay. So this will be your MCQ question. So this will be question. So this is for you. The student will not see what is. This is not seen by the student. This is the question text, which is actually seen by the student. So what is the uh, largest something? So you just, okay. So you add your question. The default mark is one. General feedback. Of course, lecturers don't want to add this again and again, so you don't. You may not want to add 100 questions. You have to key in 100 times. So well done or whatever. So you have to keep adding this by default. Okay, one answer only. So if you have multiple, you can add. Uh, if, for example, if you have multiple answer, you can give 0 0.5 marks for each. But usually, one answer is uh, one answer only. So if you have two correct, you can, for example, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. We shuffle the choices. Yes. This is the default number one, two, three. This is just by default. So choice one will be, for example, answer one, in which case your answer is correct. So you get full marks, 100%. So that means for the first answer, which is correct, you get 100%. Choice two will be answer two. Just give you the answer two. For this, the answer, it will get no marks, and answer three also gets no marks. 
no marks for these answers. So this is the correct answer. Now, every time this is entirely up to a lecturer, you can give feedback or you can defer the feedback. Means no need to give feedback if you need uh, to. Uh, tedious to type all this. So every time you have to, you have to like, for example, correct. Oh, well done, and so on. But usually students don't read this. You don't have to add this if you don't wish to. You can also add other things inside. For example, you can add uh, image file in this, and you can add, for example, attachment image file if you are showing the description of something and you ask the student which is choose the correct image. So you can select the, these as well. Okay. Once you are done with everything. Okay, you're saved and then you're done. You don't change the other parameters such as multiple tries because we have set it in the main quiz uh, window. So save changes. Now what happens is that the question pops up over here. You can see the question here. Okay, so it's in the system. Now you can add again a new question. I just do it by default. So true false is uh, simple. So you edit true false. This is your actual question text. It's true. Oh, you it's a statement usually. Is and then you say default mark A. So the correct answer is true. And then you say this is true. So the correct answer is true. So you can give your statement here. So you give them a statement which is actually true. The correct answer is true. Okay, so the statement has to be true. So then you give them a statement that is correct. And this one you don't um, change because again you have set it by global default is that they only have one attempt. If you change this to multiple tries then you will have to set a penalty for that. Okay, so save changes. Okay, now you have two questions ready, readily available. What you need to do is you need to add each and every question individually. So you keep on doing this add and so, and then you, again you put a new question and so on and so forth. So this is where it becomes challenging because you need to keep adding questions one at a time. Usually if I have uh, around 50 questions, it will take around almost a whole day to, if you add it with feedback and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's how you do it. Now, after everything is complete, you save the quiz and then you have your quiz questions here. So you go back to your quiz, okay, and you attempt quiz now, and you'll have to give a password because I have already opened it. So it will ask me, even though I'm the admin, it'll still ask me for the quiz, okay. Now the quiz, if you open it, you will see, that you should be able to see the questions. Okay, I just edit quiz, things, quiz, descriptor. Okay, save. So you'll have your instructions and your quiz coming up here. Okay, so that's how we run the quiz. Do you have any questions related to the quiz before I move on to the ICANN? All right. So I'm going to show you how we operate ICANN. So in ICANN to import questions in ICANN, you have to actually import from using this button here, which is the question bank. Okay. So in this question bank, right, you will have all the questions which you created. Now, if you have followed my instruction from the beginning of the uh, training where I told you about backup and restore, once you create a backup and restore, you don't have to create question banks for the rest of your uh, like you're teaching, you're, you're teaching, for example, the course for four or five semesters successively, your question bank will be carried forward when you back up and restore. But you have to be careful with that because if you basically uh, create the question bank and the students already know the question, they're shared with the next batch, you're, you're not uh, testing their cognitive ability because they already reach the, maybe the first or second level, so they are not actually using logic, so you have to be careful with that. But overall, you can add questions in the system as well. I have heard uh, stories about students that actually use Quora, the Quora on Google search, they will put in the question Quora and then because the question is in a question bank where it has been done before Quora actually detects the question. So again, cognitive, uh, uh, testing cognitive ability is a challenging thing for us nowadays because most of the answers are available online. But this one, you can actually create a question bank here. So 
what you need to do is in the question bank you need to go on the import function and there's an import and export so import is to import files and export is to export your question bank to maybe to another course so you import okay okay now in the import format right in the import one you will see i will just zoom on this it will ask you for there are different formats i can and there's gift actually gift is actually a format which uh, is uh, some of lecturers will be using but for gift format right you actually have to have some programming skills so please don't go into that uh, unless you're interested in programming because you can actually select logic okay the student can actually key in an essay question in gift format you can actually select logic but again uh, don't go into that because it's quite complex unless you are uh, you like programming the system for gift but i can is the most uh, simple format so we just use i can so i just click on i can so the file format is i can and then i choose a file now the file which i'm choosing is actually the notepad file which i created okay so i save it as i can okay i showed you the i can file and this one is upload this file okay import okay so it asks you the two questions and then i continue okay so now you can see the quiz actually has got questions here so it has a lms and this is actually imported from the i can file okay so they are all from the i can file and i can actually select all the questions here and i can move to the default for ipmv roadshow here in the system okay so all the questions are now in the ipmv folder so you can actually view you can actually go here to your IPMB Roadshow, any of you. You can click on the um, go down, go to the admin box. I think you are a student, so I will just change it later. So you can actually click on the question bank later, and then you can see all the questions over here. Okay. Now, suppose I create, I want to create a new quiz. Okay, so I want to create a quiz, new quiz. Let's see how we use that I can, all those I can and the questions. So I cre create a new quiz, add an activity resource. I create a quiz. Uh, add so I create the quiz too. Okay, and then I put a description. So this uh, timing. Okay, I won't change this parameters. Okay, I just want to show you how the questions will appear. Yes. All questions. Okay, I put two questions per page. I want to show you how they look. Uh, I won't change any parameters here. And I will save and display the quiz. So I have created the most easiest, uh, uh, most, uh, how do you say, least stringent quiz. So the student can work with it. So I click on that. I want to add questions. So I add quiz, edit quiz. Okay. I set the maximum grade, for example, based on my table four. This one has 10 marks. And I will select multiple items here. So I can add here, add from a question bank. Okay. So this is the question bank. So these are all the questions in my question bank. For example, if I had 100 questions, I can actually select the ones which I want for that quiz. So I'm adding all and I add selected questions to quiz. Now all the questions are in the quiz. It also shows the pagination, which means when the student clicks on page one, they will see this. Page two, they will see this. Okay, I save save everything and I save. Okay, now the quiz is done. I save. Okay, and then I go back to my quiz. Okay. Let's look at it, how it looks in the overall system. Now you can try it yourself. You can go here and you can select your quiz. Please do that because I will show you how the grade book is set up. Okay, let me attempt the quiz. So I click here, attempt the quiz. So now there's no timer, there's nothing. I've just left it open. So I click here, attempt quiz now. Okay, so it shows you, okay, which is the correct answer. Okay, this one, and I just select here. Two questions per page, next page. Again, I select this one, true. Okay, next, finishing time. Okay, so once the student has seen everything completed, they have to actually go to submit all and finish. Okay, submit all and finish okay so once they submit all and finish they will see the correct answers okay and then i finish okay now this is what has been attempted by the 
students. So if all of you who have enrolled for the course now, just attempt the quiz, randomly answer, and I will show you how the grade book is set up. I need you to answer or else I cannot show you grade book, <laughs> that feature in the system. Okay, let's look at the report and I can see who is accessing quiz here by looking at content access. Okay, so now I can see at 11 o'clock, Okay, the time is 11.17. You can see that uh, everyone is maybe attempting the quiz and I can see the quiz marks here. Okay, so. so you can see the quiz if it's a one day. So we will just go back. I just did this to show you what's happening in the system. <clears throat> you can monitor the system at any given time determining the activity. Okay, now in this course, let's see how many of you are actually there. So you can see here, everyone is here. And this is actually the log of usage. So you can see who's accessing the course at any given time. So now I know that uh, Dr. Rafida is actually it may be attempting the quiz. So that's a three second lag. So things like that you can actually track using the system. Okay, now let's look at the next important thing, which is the grade book. I've shown you how to create the basic 1732 we have. You can do two activity, which is your quiz or your assignment. And uh, the assignment, of course, I won't uh, show you because assignment, you already know how to do it. Do you need me to cover assignment? Dr. Nazia, you want me to cover assignment or is everyone familiar with assignment? Uh, doctor, maybe maybe you can go through because we have some new assignment. lectures. Okay, 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 okay. For new lecture, actually, we need to have a specific training. Okay, please submit, uh, Dr. Nazia, you can please submit the names of the new lecturer to PEP. Uh, you submit to them under IPMB. What I am doing is I will attempt, uh, I will attempt to do a full training for them, a one day training so that they are familiar with the system. Okay, so, okay, this is how we do it. So, assignment, right, is something which you give to students. So, if you are a new lecturer, you will know that assignment is either given by group or given by individual okay now usually with group the complaint will be <laughs> i did all the work and my colleagues did not so this one is up, actually up to them but it's a reflection of the integrity of the students we have no say in that i mean we can only advise so usually when you want to do assignment you will ask them uh, give them an assignment so let me go to assignment now there are many other systems over here there's database so if you all are using statistics you can access this database icon and you can add your statistical content here. And there's something known as COM, which is, uh, we don't have that over here because it requires uh, additional software. Okay, let's look at assignment. Add. Okay. And we call it assignment one. Okay, now in the description, right? Uh, you have to give the instruction. But what's very important is to give what are known as the rubrics, okay? So for those of you who want to investigate further, right? I will show you one website, right? Rubrics, I'll add the link here for you. Okay. For those of you who are new and who are not familiar with rub rubrics, you can actually go into this Ruby star system and you can extract rubrics from here. For example, if you have, want science rubrics, you can actually have science rubrics for, for example, for the uh, wait, uh, I need lab report. Okay. You can have a rubric for lab report. These are ready-made rubrics here. You can actually download these rubrics. You can set the marks and rubrics. Actually, I cannot cover that in today's training because this one will require about one hour, but you can go and uh, you can investigate this particular uh, Ruby star, which will end. I'll I'll copy the link and I'll save it here. I'll put it in your roadshow. Okay, so I'm going to call it. Insert the link here. Okay, so ru uh, rubrics is basically defining the criteria for the assessment. So usually when we give the students assignment, we have to define a rubric, right? What defines a rubric in terms of like, for example, you have ten marks. For the assignment then you need to say if you uh if you for example if you cite four references you pub you state the uh, protocol then you will get full marks if you for example you got two references you have 50 percent of the marks so these rubrics have to be stated very clearly at the beginning of the assignment or else your students it's not fair on the students so these are stated here now this additional uh, box is for content 
which you may have, for example, you need to give them some kind of material. For example, you are teaching them uh, descriptive taxonomy and you want to give them some file on taxonomy and then you ask them. So you need to add your document here. Okay. Now, this one, we usually uh, set it uh, stringent because we don't like students to uh, exceed the time for assignment because two reasons. First, they will keep delaying it and secondly, it can create problems for you because you will have a backlog. So, usually you have a cutoff date and a grading date. Okay. And this one, you don't have to change much. Okay. Online text file submission. Now, this one, you need to change if the, okay, suppose you have a student whose uh, assignment is a video, for example, a video report. You ask them to upload it to YouTube or any other of the uh, channels. Like we have, for example, in uh, UMS, we have YouTube, we have Microsoft Stream. You can ask them to use Microsoft Stream. All students in UMS have a Microsoft Stream account. Okay, so you ask them to upload, they know usually how to do it. And then you can ask them to put up a link. That's for files which are in excess of 20 MB. This applies to assignments as well. Excess of 20 MB, they need to upload link. They can't upload a file. It's the system won't take that. The system, we cannot exceed this. Okay, so you have feedback types, submission settings, and you need to click yes. Yes, this one is, okay, some students will say we submitted it, but uh, it, was, it didn't get uploaded. When you do this, you will actually get a statement saying that, uh, your submission, are you ready? To, are you sure? And the student clicks yes. Then they cannot say we didn't upload and things like that. Okay, so that's what we do. Group submissions uh, settings. If you click on this, what will happen is that only the uh, leader of each group can submit. So now we have two groups which I created in the morning. So if we submit in groups, only one can submit. Okay, no, but so it's individual. Notifications, yes, you submit everything and so on and so forth. And then you have grade. Okay, now this one is again something which will save you a lot of trouble if you fill it up properly. Okay, now if you give a point grade, for example, in your table 4.2, you refer for assignment. You had, for example, two assignments. Each assignment has 20 marks. So you give maximum grade 20. Now, when you do this setting, you will save a lot of time later on because usually if we give a maximum grade 100 and then we have to scale down you'll have a problem because you're able to scale down. You have 100 students, you have to scale down 100 marks from, so you, so you have to again work with the Excel worksheet. Instead of doing all that, you just set a maximum grade based on your table 4.2. And then you have a simple, direct, this one you don't change, okay? You have common module settings, uh, restrict access. You can add a restriction, for example, student who default does not attend classes, you can add a restriction here. So if they don't attend your lecture one, lecture two, lecture three, you can actually block them from doing assignment. This one you need to set as conditions are met. Uh, you have tags and competencies. Usually tags you don't, you can add a tag, sign one. Okay. So that will be a tag. You click on enter, it's gonna, and then you save and display. Now what's happening is that your assignment comes up here. <coughs> so once you, one student, what you can do, right? as an exercise. Now, those of you who are free, uh, who are online and who can do something, you can just click on it and you submit a blank PDF page. Just a PDF document, you submit blank page in the system. Don't submit Word, you submit PDF page. I'll show you how it works. Okay, so that's the assignment for this session. So now I'm going to turn my editing off and I will show you grade book. Okay, now in this course, right, for example, at the end of the week, uh, 14, the 14th week, you want to compile all your marks for your for your vetting and so on and so forth, vetting meeting. Now, with this system, once you set up the grade book, you have set up your quiz, your assignments, and other marking uh, in the grade in this particular system. You all you need to do is go to grades. Okay. And you have a grader report. Okay. Now these are all our students here okay. in the system. You can see here that the quiz, right, has been automatically. So, uh, see, uh, one, Dr. Rafida's name is here. Then Dr. Bernadette is here and Dr. Thero is here. Okay. They have tried, attempted the quiz. The marks have been recorded automatically. I don't have to go into the system again and look for all this. If I had quiz one, 
and they had completed the quiz one, quiz two, the IPMB chat, Padlet chat, and I've given marks for all of these. I can actually see the total marks here. So now you can see the total marks coming up here. So if they complete the assignment, okay, and I, then I grade the assignment, the marks will come here. So at the end of the semester, end of the session or the uh, semester when you're ready for it, all you do is come here. You click on, you go to grader report, and then you can click on export. Okay, this is the export button. Now, when you click on export, okay, it will actually compile all the file in an Excel or a CSV format. So now in this, I don't want to know the attendance time. I don't want to know what Padlet chat. I'm only interested in quiz one, quiz two, and assignment and course total. I just want these four columns in my uh, exported file. So done. I will select Excel spreadsheet here. So ODS, you will, if you open in this, you can open in any other software beside Windows and all. So this is ODS, but usually we will use Excel. Click Excel. Okay. Leave. Okay. So I select Excel. Okay. So I select Excel worksheet, export Excel worksheet. Okay. Download. Done. So once you do this, you will see all the marks in a Excel worksheet. Okay, so currently uh, I cannot open this window because I have to share the window and then again the system will hang. But you get the idea is that what you will get is your Excel worksheet with all your students' names and you will see everyone's name in order. If you want to adjust the alphabetical order, you can do that and so on and so forth. And the Excel worksheet will export all this content into your computer. So you can see here. You will see the averages. It will also calculate the averages uh, later on and so on and so forth. But what this system does is it allows you to do everything in one click. You don't have to go and uh, record everything separately. So that's the thing which we want to highlight and encourage the, the lecturers to carry out. Use your grade. So you can set up in this, you can set up your scales and so on and so forth. Okay, the system will do basically uh, does what our SMP does. It will, you can plot uh graphs in the system okay so you can have your grader report and your grade settings and you can set up your grade boundaries okay all these things can be set up in the system however when you set up the grade book usually we do the training in the blended learning uh instruction so it takes about uh two hours of training on grade book setup but once your grade book is set up you'll uh, you'll get your output as grader and you'll get all your graphs as well all your bell curve and so on and so forth okay so that's what you see so this is under uh, grader report. So you go back to your course and it will be here. This course grades and you can get your grader report here. Export as uh, in the format which you require. So that's about the grading. Okay, I think I reach uh, Dr. Nazia. Have I reached the time limit? I cannot see the time here. Is yeah, it? another one minute, Doctor. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, I won't accept. So for the MOC training, right? Because MOC requires about an hour of training. I think I'll have to do that specifically for those lecturers who are interested in uh, developing MOC. Is that okay with you? Is that okay? okay. Yeah, yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. So, so I will show you something here. So you will get a heads up of what is MOC and what are the steps. Okay, there, there are only seven steps which you need to complete. So the first one is uh, I can share the course template with Dr. Nazia. It's the course template. So you, if you decide to do an MOC, you need to complete a course template and submit it to PEP with the names of two uh, reviewers. So the, after the review process, they will give you their comments, improve recommendations, and then your course is ready for the smart to UMS. That This last part is done by us. So regarding the recording facilities and so on and so forth, uh, PEP has, we have already paid for the um, studio. So we have paid about, I think it's about 130,000 uh, Ringgit Malaysia has been paid for a studio. The contractor is supposed to install it by the end of April. So once the studio is ready, you can come there and you can record using green screen and all the other techniques. Okay, whatever you need to do, we have there. Okay, so, okay. Dr. Mabel asked is, one minute, huh? can I see your chat? I cannot see the chat, one second. Huh? Okay, Dr. who are the reviewers? Yeah, okay. Who are the reviewers, right? Okay, the reviewers are two experts from your field. It can be anybody. For example, the food technology, 
uh, we did with FSMP. They are reviewers maybe from chemistry or other departments, biochemistry. Okay, for IPMB, it can be reviewer from anybody from uh, your field, from your own faculty. Your colleagues yourself can be reviewers. We don't have any uh, fiction. The reviewers will be given a letter of the uh, appointment as reviewer. So, obviously, that adds to the ELNPT. Okay, is this clear? So the entire process of the MOOC uh, development takes play takes maybe around four to six weeks. Okay, if you have your lectures ready, four to six weeks will be sufficient for the MOC. We will give you more details, and I will organize a special session only on MOOC for the staff. So MOOC is also open not only to our uh, academic staff, it's also open to our administrative staff because some of the administrative staff, the taklimat and all can be delivered by a MOC. We have done that already in the system. Okay, so now we open for Q&A. Dr. Any Q&A is there, Dr. Nazia? <laughs> Any Q&A session or you want to have your photograph session? I will stop sharing us. Uh, so, if you need to have your photography session or if you need any question and answer, you can turn on your mic and shout out. It's perfectly okay. Yes, I think Dr. Mabel, raise your hand. Uh, there's a hand here. Sorry, that was an old one. Okay, okay. Anyway, Sorry. thank you, Dr. Kanner. Uh, thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. It has so, been really useful. Useful, but too fast, right? Because two hours is like a uh, bit too fast, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's also online, so I cannot show you certain things like Notepad, which I'm manipulating at the same time. Yeah, that's the limitation. Maybe... Mm. Yeah, sorry. You could see the Notepad when I was showing you, Dr. Mabel. Could you see the Notepad on the screen? No, we couldn't see. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what. But, so. Yeah, I, I, I've used it before, so that's not the big problem. Yeah, so. I can imagine your, <laughs> your notepad. Yeah, it's it's here, but I cannot show it. I showed you the tab, so you can see the notepad over there. Any other questions? I have a question, Doctor Kenner. Can you hear yes, me? Dr. Mar yes, Doctor Maran, can you hear you loud and clear. Uh, really, it's very good uh, presentation. We we all enjoyed it, and thank you very much. It is very useful for us. And my question is on MOOC. MOOC, we have to submit the video presentation or just template is like a typing information like that? Yeah, for the MOOC, right? You just submit the template. Okay. If you have videos, uh, it's good. One, one second. Uh, if you have, if you just give me one minute, uh, actually, there's a template for the MOOC. I will distribute it later. So to the, uh, to everyone. So we have a MOOC template. Uh, this MOOC template, right, is useful for, I'm actually opening my driver, so I'll just get the link for that. This MOOC template is actually from uh, OE, from the, I will share with you a PDF file. Okay, I just share, so I copy a link, I share with you, share, copy link. So if you're at UMS, you can sh uh, share the link one second, I just go to the, Correct. Okay. Share. Okay. Okay. So I'm sharing a link with you. That's the template, Dr. Maran. So if you have your lecture notes ready, right, in a video format, which a reviewer can see, it's good enough. If you don't have it, you just share your outline of that particular course. So generally for MOOC, which I will tell you is, uh, we tell the lecturer during the training is usually one CLO for one MOOC. Okay. Don't exceed more than one CLO. So one MOOC is one CLO. And the number of lectures is around four to five. Each lecture is around 10 to 15 minutes duration. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I think if, if there is any question, maybe uh, they can pass to me. I will collect and email to yeah. you, Dr. Kenneth. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, Nazia, for your help. Uh, maybe we can take a group photo for this uh, session. Yeah, whoever is online and willing, we can He's turn on, on the camera. your camera. <laughs> if you're in UMS, so everyone is there. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, okay, so we... I'll just take screenshot, yeah? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. One, two, three. All right, one, two, three. Okay, see you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything thank else, you. you please inform us immediately, yeah. okay? And apologies for the breakdown on Monday. <laughs> it was a breakdown. Thank you so much.